Okay, so welcome everybody. My name's Ag Stevens. I'm the head of partnerships at the Centre for Environmental Data Analysis, or CEDA, in the UK. And um, firstly, I just want to say that we are recording this meeting. So if anyone would, would not like to be seen on video or wants to obscure their name, um, do whatever you need to do, and that's fine. Um, if, if you need us to, to not release the recording to anyone else of what you've been on so far, just let us know, and that's also fine. Um, so the purpose of this meeting is to share with all of you uh, some developments that we've been doing at CEDA um, that probably came out of discussions over the last couple of years. And I think within the last nine months, we've, we've started work for real on this stuff. Um, so we have been interested in the idea of some kind of um, search system that we could put all our environmental data holdings into um, that could provide a quick, responsive, faceted search um, and could scale up to potentially billions of records. Um, without too much of a problem. So, so that's kind of where this work came from. And along the way, we found out about uh, this thing called Stack, which Richard will tell you more about. Um, and we, it looked like that was something that we should invest some time in. And so we've, we've gone about trying to build an indexing system and a search system and with the idea of a, a, some kind of search clients as well, um, that are all trying to use Stack as their standard definition of the API. Um, but we're also looking at extending it in ways that we think are really useful for our community. Um, so the aim of the meeting is that we share where we are with this. We are doing our best to make it all open source and all working with existing repositories, et cetera. Um, but our, our greatest hope is that some of you will see this and say, we have the same problem or the same requirement. We would like to work on that with you. Um, because we think a lot of this is very generic. And even if there's only some parts of it that you like the look of, we would love to get collaboration going and seeing if more more than one of us can all be working on the system together. So, so the first point of today is we are on a development track where we are part of the way through. We don't know how far we are through it, but this is definitely not a presentation of a final product. And when we get onto the discussion phase a bit later, um, your, your very honest feedback is welcome. So you might like some parts of this and say some parts of this are looking bad or we need to change. And we're very open to that discussion because we want to make this work for the community. Um, and I suppose our, our hope is that this may also be an appropriate candidate for the next generation of ESGF search. Um, but we, we see it as being a, a generalized search system that could be used for it, but basically any scientific data. That's the way we like to think of it. So um, I just want to introduce a few of my colleagues that are here. So Richard Smith has been the project lead on the project. Um, good afternoon, Richard. And Richard will, will talk you through most of what we've got done through some presentations and some demos. Um, he's encouraged you to, well, he's asked me to say that he's very happy to, for this to be interrupt based. So whenever you have a question, type it into Zoom, raise your hand or just unmute and interrupt um, let's make it as interactive as we can um, um, we've also got here um reese evans um say hello reese hello super thank you so reese reese is, has been working um in richard's team um developing various aspects of this but um doing some significant work on a, a front end application to talk to the stack service and we also have phil kershaw here somewhere um and i defy anyone here not to know no. phil and not to have spoken to him in the past at some point phil, phil was one of the um 
the the big brains behind this in terms of leading it and trying to work out how we should go about trying to solve this problem. Okay, so just before we get on, I'll I'll share the um the location of the agenda with you. So just just putting in the chat here the agenda and I'll share my screen so that we can have a quick look at it. And so, yeah, please, please add your name and affiliation to, to the agenda. Um, and at the bottom of it, I've created an action summary and notes section. So I'm gonna take the role of note taker um, and general chair here. So I'll, I'll try and capture the, the main points and, and any discussion points that we come up with um, and any actions that come up, I'm gonna put in here as we go. Um, but if there's if you have any questions and you want to add them in here as well, let, let's just have a question section. Feel free to add questions in there um, and we can address them later. So in terms of what we're going to talk about, um, so Richard will, will talk us through various slide sets. Um, we're going to give an introduction on um, you know, why we're running this session, what we'd like to get out of it. Um, also ask to just think about what you'd like to get out of it. Um, so use that as an opportunity to, to let us know as well. Um, talk about the, the problems that we're trying to solve um, through this work. Um, and then Richard will go on and talk in more detail about Stack itself. So give a bit more of a, a grounding as to what that is. Um, walk you through the, the API. Um, and then we will delve more into the indexing framework. So part of all of this is um, how do you go about having a load of files on disk or on tape or object store or something, and then generating some kind of catalog from it. So our indexing framework is, is the back end um, toolkit and, and various, various systems and tools to do that. So we'll talk through the Stack API server, <clears throat> and we're using Elasticsearch um, as our scalable backend to do to store all the content. Um, and then we'll go on talk about things like vocabularies, um, what we haven't done yet, or what what we can't do at this point in time, and then what the roadmap timeline looks like. And then once we've worked through all that. If, if we still haven't discussed everything during that point, we'll come on to a, a direct discussion session. And there's just some, some questions to, to prompt that discussion. And, and as I say, we are, we are not at all precious about this work. Um, we want to make it as useful as possible. And we may have made some assumptions that need to change. And there may be aspects of, of our design that need to change. Um, but if, if you can see an opportunity to get involved and to work with us, then, well, then that will be fantastic. So I think that's, that's enough from me. Um, just before I hand over to Richard, do we, do we have any um, questions or comments at this point? Okay, that's perfect. Richard, over to you. And... Um, as I say, feel free to put questions in or raise your hand during the presentations and um, we'll keep track of them. Thank you. Okay. I realize while you're talking, I've missed a thing, so I've just quickly added it in. Right. So, let me get a screen. Find the button. Right, so yes, um, we are, as Ag said, we're really looking for kind of collaboration and uh, please do interrupt. So 
Um, there are four sets of slides. The first one is kind of an introduction to what we're here for. Um, we're going to talk about uh, kind of stack itself. Then the second set of slides is about the indexing framework. Um, the third one goes into the kind of API server. And then the fourth one is just sort of a wrap up and, and roadmap. Now, they've been made into four separate presentation sets just because they're kind of discrete chunks. Um, but uh, hopefully it all flows together as a bit of a story. Um, but yeah, please do interrupt, ask questions. And um, like I say, we're looking for collaboration. So comments are, are very helpful. So in this first set of slides, um, we're going to look at why we're running the session. Quickly, what are we hoping to get from the meeting? And I'll also ask what you're hoping to get. And I'm hoping that either we'll have a, a flurry of action in the chat or um, a load of people unmuting and talking. Uh, we we'll talk about the problem that we're trying to solve, which we hope is a problem that you also have. And then just a quick run through of what Stack is itself. So why are we here? We think that there is a shared desire to search and represent our data. We also think that the challenges encountered by the different institutions are similar. So we think that the thing, problems that we have and the challenges that we have are problems and challenges that you also share. And we also think that building a common solution will save us time. It will reduce the maintenance burden and make it easier for our users to interoperate. So if we're all using the same uh, APIs, then our users will be used to using the same tools in, in di against different institutions and organizations. What we're looking for is, um, we're, first of all, we're going to share information of what we've done. Um, I think some of you will be familiar from other meetings of, of the kind of work we've been up to, but just kind of really lay down where we are, what we've done so far, what our, what our thinking is, um, so you can then challenge that thinking. We're hoping to go on a real collaboration and co-development, so we want people to say that they will assist us in working on particular aspects. And, and really try using it in their own home institutions as well. And uh, through using it in different places, we'll find the different bugs and where it's not um, reusable. And we can hopefully iron those out and make it a smoother process for everybody. And we want to get your feedback. So as I said, we're not 100% fixed on our approach. Um, this is the kind of where we've got to so far based on our experience, um, information that we've got, and through trying a few things out and seeing what what sticks um so this is where we are but we're not 100 percent fixed so i'm going to ask a question and um i don't know whether chat or unmuting is the best way or hands up what would you like to get from this meeting what are you hoping to get it's fine if there are are no responses at this point yeah but if you if you have thoughts, um, feel free to put them into the um, Google Doc. Yeah, even mild interest is still a, a thing. <laughs> Indeed. Okay. So um, we're going to talk about a basic orientation of Stack and what it is. Present our approach. Uh, I've got some live demos as well. Uh, so hope, fingers crossed they all work. They worked earlier, um, but uh, you never know with live demos. And things like our operational deployment, our API server, and at the end we're going to talk about, we're going to ask for a discussion and, and feedback. So the kind of problem, start off with some background of CEDA. So the CEDA archive, we have more than 13 petabytes of atmospheric and earth observation data coming from many different sources. So that could be satellite observations, it could be model runs, it could be um, measurements from aircraft or ground stations or um, all sorts of different places. Uh, different scientists are creating data in different ways. They have different data practices. And um, we've got historical data that goes back, you know, many years so that the practices that are standard now weren't established then. Um, so we have a huge amount of variety in our data both in quality, in, in metadata quality and quantity. And that presents a, a big problem for us. They see the catalog, which is sort of our top level um, breakdown of the data we have, has more than 7,000 data sets in it. 
And uh, we have about 340 million files in our archive growing at a rate of about 200,000 a day. So this is not just a problem of, um, we have some data, we want to expose it, but it's a continuing problem where every day there is more coming in that also needs exposing in the same way. So we've got a, a, a kind of liveness problem as well as a historical and, and heterogeneous problem. And our data is stored in different places. So we've got majorities on POSIX disk, um, but some of our larger data sets, for example, things like the Sentinel archive are stored primarily on tape with just metadata files on disk. And we're also starting to experiment with object stores. So we've got data in, in different places, um, different quality, different amounts of metadata, uh, different standards applied. Uh, it presents a real problem. And if you're trying to make a, a solution that fits all of those, um, that presents a real challenge. So what are we looking for? We need something that's scalable um, because of the aforementioned scale. We want something that's repeatable. So when we run our indexing operation and we want to get a result and then let's say we want to add something or let's say that we needed to bring all that back we need to be able to run the same code and um, get the same result back what we don't want is to have to hand edit stuff after the fact and then if we repeat it we lose that information so the information gathering needs to be uh, kind of solidified in, in the code in the process or in the configuration so that we can repeat it and get the same results back. It needs to be able to handle heterogeneous data. And it needs to be able to work with multiple data sources. For the ones I mentioned are POSIX, standard disk, uh, object store, and a tape archive as well. And it needs to be able to work with a live ingest system where we've got uh, 200,000 files coming through every day that need adding uh, to this, this catalog. We also want something that provides faceted search. Um, we want something that allows us to search all the items. So I, I don't know how many of you have, have got similar things, but we've um, used open search in the past and open search has really good strong points. Um, but one of the things that I think makes it difficult to use is this lack of, uh, in open search they're called granules. In stack they're called items. We'll go into the terminology in a bit. Um, but in open search, it's very hierarchical. Things are, are, are siloed into groups and you can search within a group, but you can't do across group searches where stack flattens that whole architecture. So yes, you do have hierarchy and you do have groups um, and that that's fine. That makes sense. You can follow those trees and everything is good. But if you want to search everything, you can also do that um, using the stack API. And we want something that works with different domains and vocabularies. So um, we mentioned the heterogeneity. So things like satellite imagery has one vocabulary um, and then modeling data has a different vocabulary and uh, kind of observational data has, has different vocabularies. And each individual project, um, each domain will have different vocabularies and, and ways that they're used to searching for things. So we, we wanted something that could work in that environment as well. And um, from our experience so far, we think Stack can satisfy those requirements. Um, so I, I'm going to attempt a poll just to see how many people have done any work with Stack. So hopefully you'll see a poll appear on your screen in a second. If you could vote just to see, have you actually had a go working with Stack at all? Um, I'm just trying to understand whether people know what it is. So it looks like roughly a third have done Stack and everyone else hasn't done any work with it. Um, so hopefully the next few slides will kind of uh, help with a bit of orientation. So this I've lifted straight off the Stack website. So um, one of the really good things about Stack that perhaps makes it win over open search um, is simply how easy it is to find information. If you type in open search into Google, then you'll get uh, Amazon's latest um, Elastic Search Fork, and the name's kind of been taken over. And finding information about the search standard is sort of buried in wikis around the internet. So it's a bit harder to find. Whereas Stack um, has a bit of a web presence. So this, this text snippet here was taken from stackspec.org. Um, 
and I'm just going to read it and then we can talk about it. So the spatial temporal asset catalog stack specification provides a common language to describe a range of geospatial information so it can be more easily indexed and discovered. A spatial temporal asset is any file that represents information about the Earth captured in a certain space and time. The goal is for all providers of spatial temporal assets, be it imagery, SAR, point clouds, data cubes, motion video, etc., to expose their data as spatial temporal asset catalogs or stack so that new code doesn't need to be written whenever a new data set or API is released. So I think on Heg looks like he's going to say something. Yeah. I, I read that earlier, Richard, and I was just thinking that last sentence. It's, it's easy to read that and think that they're talking about the kind of the API to all the data, not just to catalog records. Um, and I suppose I'm just wondering what your interpretation is on that. Um, I think if we're talking catalog, aren't we? We're talking metadata. That's, that's my understanding. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was going to say that even on the Stack website themselves, they have a, an XKCD comic which says about, you know, there are 19 standards. What would be really good is if there was a one that could collect them all, and then so they create another standard, and there are 20. Um, and although I think everyone who creates a standard wishes that theirs replaces all other standards, um, there probably are places where it doesn't fit. But um, and we'll, we'll quickly, I think it's a, a bit later on, which talks about some of the areas where it doesn't quite work. But um, for the most part, the stack kind of specification and the API is really good. So we're gonna go into a little bit about what the individual parts of it are. So there are four main kind of object types in stack. Um, again, this is taken from the stack spec.org. And on the next slide, we'll kind of distill that down into what that means for us um, specifically, or, or what our interpretation of this is um, in terms of like Earth system modeling data and, and the data that we have and understand. Um, so this is what Stack says they are, and then we'll say what we said they are, and hopefully they're fairly well aligned. So at the top level, you have a catalog, um, which is a simple flexible JSON file of links that provides a structure to organize and browse stack items. So it, it basically is a, a collection object that provides pointers to other things. The next object type is a collection, and it's an extension of the stack catalog with additional information, such as things like a geospatial extent. It adds information like the, the license for the data. You can add keywords. You can add providers um, and all sorts of other things. But, and it describes the stack items that fall within the collection. So we'll talk about what an item is in a minute. But a collection essentially is um, gathering together and summarizing metadata on the underlying objects that are linked to it. So a stack item is the core atomic unit and represents a single, so this is where we might change the definition on the next slide. It says represents a single spatial temporal asset as a geojson feature plus date, time, and links. So this is a, a thing that you can link out to. Um, this, work, this is where your facets go. So um, let's say you've got a, a time series or like a satellite scene. That would be your stack item. And your stack item would then have met facets relating to that particular thing. So a satellite scene might have processing level. It might have um, geospatial temporal extent. It might have uh, the satellite that it came from, the instrument it came from, that kind of information. And assets are an object that contains a URI to data associated with the item that can be downloaded or streamed. So this is your actual jumping off point to something real that you can, you can work with. So the, the top three are kind of uh, part of stack. That's your API that allows you to kind of search things and find things. And once you get to the asset level at the bottom, you are provided with a URI that is something you can tangibly use. So that could go into your um, data visualization pipeline or, or whatever. So next, I said, well, I'll talk about what is stack for us. Um, this is what we interpret those things to mean. 
in the context of the data that we have at CEDA. So a collection is a set of items with a common vocabulary. Um, and we've said slash DRS, so something like CMIP6. Obviously, all that data there has the same kind of vocabulary. So you've got source ID, you've got institution ID, you've got um, other things I can't remember off the top of my head. But also the, the, the vocabulary for accessing that information is all the same. And we say that, that forms a collection. Next, we have an item. So this is a meaningful group of one or more files. So um, in some cases, you might link out to a single NetCDF file, for example. Um, or it might be that in terms of a satellite scene, so I'm thinking in terms of Sentinel, you've got the quick look image, you've got a metadata file, you've got a zip file, and then you've got the actual data itself. And all of those things comprise one item because they are related and they're, they are together. And then we go down to asset. So this is a single data file, e.g. one net CDF file. So in, if your stack item was a time series, that might be made up of um, 10 net CDF files. So you'd have one item, which is your time series, and that would have 10 assets, which are linked to that item, if that makes sense. Are people with me or have I lost people? Now's a good time to ask questions. Silence is good. Okay. The other thing that stat can do is it can be static or dynamic. So um, quite a lot of things that exist at the moment, when we talk to people in the community, they... Richard. Yes. So, sorry, we just, just had a, a good comment from Kevin that it's worth stopping for and just thinking about okay. before we go on. Really want to know how you define meaningful. Okay. Um, so I'll go back if I can. Um, meaningful probably depends on your users. So uh, each domain will have a different uh, opinion of what is meaningful. So, um, yeah, in terms of satellite imagery, you're talking about scenes and tiles. Um, for other communities, you might be talking about time series or data cubes. Um, so it, it depends what your, the users of the data, if that specific domain determine as meaningful is probably what you would then stick as a meaningful object. And just, just I suppose, to, to bring it into the context of the ESGF world and Earth system modeling data, um, I'm, I'm thinking of it as a, um, as a single variable for a single realization experiment model, et cetera. Um, and it's the entire domain that that variable is available for. So it might be 3D or 4D but it will typically be the whole spatial domain and the whole temporal domain um, being captured in an item. Um, and this maybe brings us on to the next question, which is how does an item in stack match the item in a group of NetCDF files? Um, I suspect, Richard, that will come to light as you show examples. Is that fair to say? Let me just uh, process the question. How does an item in stack, can you say it again? How does a, an item in stack, as in GeoJSON, match the item as a group of NetCDF files? You mean how is it represented? Um, I think so. Okay. If it's how it's represented, then yes, we'll look at that. <laughs> so, so yeah, I suppose I, I would say that the GeoJSON is, is a metadata description that includes thing like, things like here is the time window, um, here is the bounding box, um, that kind of information. Um, but the, the assets themselves are the things that point to individual NetCDF files. Yeah, so we're, we're three, three slides away from a, a stack demo where we actually open up a browser and look at the API. Uh, and then you actually see what the responses look like in, in stack. Um, and hopefully that will help answer that. Um, Richard. Any more questions? No, okay. So yeah, it, 
when we've been talking to people, quite often people are doing static catalogs. Um, and I guess, so stack, stack has two sides of it. One is a static catalog, which is essentially just this JSON representation. You, you dump out a load of GeoJSON objects. They are linked together by URLs inside the JSON. And then you would stick that all up. Uh, what people have been doing is sticking it all up in um, like a Google Cloud on S3 or something like that. So you can you have a place and you click through and you end up with the next JSON document, you end up with the next JSON document, and that works fine. Um, there is a application called Stack Browser that can read those and present a nice, nice-ish user interface that allows you to walk through. But it's very static. You can only traverse it in the way that the original designer intended, um, which might be fine. And I, I think if you if you don't have much data, and if you all, all your data is the same or well organized, then you probably can get away with that. Um, but like I said at the beginning, we don't have that. <laughs> Our data is not necessarily well organized in all places. It's not all the same. Um, so we prefer the kind of dynamic API approach. So uh, static catalogs are a set of interlinked JSON files, which can be navigated hierarchically. Um, I think oh, we'll look at it in a second at the stack ecosystem, but on that page, I think the, the Fedio space bell one, um, they have used catalogs, so that, that top level stack item, to organize faceted search in a static catalog. So you can click, the different catalogs represent a different facet, and you can follow the tree down on based on your selection, um, but it's all, it's all static. So um, you can probably navigate everything you wanted to, but there's no sort of idea of search or anything like that. Um, the other option is dynamic catalogs, which use the stack API and in pro provide enhanced navigation and search capability. So that can perform item search, which is that kind of granule level if you're familiar with open search. Um, they can perform fasted search, other things. And, and one of, I guess one of the really nice features about stack is it's very extensible. So uh, you can modify it to your needs pretty much. Um, and I think in one of the slides, we talk about the different types of modifications. Um, but you can modify the API to it, extend its functionality, um, which is something that we have done, which we'll also talk about. Uh, the link at the bottom is about best practices. So again, the documentation is really good for Stack. That's one of its um, key selling points. And they have a whole page of best practices about um, how you might make your static catalogs and what you should include in it and that kind of stuff. So I said the, the ecosystem is really good. There's a page, I didn't put the link on here, but I will later, um, called stackindex.org. I'll add the link to the slides later. And um, that is aiming to collect together all the work that people are doing with Stack around the world. So um, you can get a list of all the Stack APIs and static catalogs that people have created all on this page. It also has things like, um, as you can see here, you've got different programming languages you can look at. There are servers, there are validation tools, visualization tools. There are data creation tools, processing tools, all this stuff, the link to the stack ecosystem is uh, presented on this page. And um, at the moment, the stuff that we've done isn't here, but we probably would like to put it here um, and make it public for other people to come and poke and prod at and comment on as you will be today. So there's a couple of things I said Stack couldn't do. Um, the first thing is, is name dependent. So Stack is spatio-temporal asset catalog. And the spatial-temporal stuff is hard baked in. You can't get rid of it. So if your um, data is on a... Um, it doesn't fit with the ISO date format. So uh, one of the things that we know is a problem is if you've got like ice cores, for example, that doesn't fit within the ISO date framework. Um, and that's a problem. And if you're, uh, we have some data in our archive, which is from Mars, obviously that doesn't fit an earth grid system. Um, so your, your database is unlikely to be able to parse coordinates and understand what to do with it. So it's a, uh, it, it, I would love to see stack become ACK and then the space and time thing become optional. 
I think that would be really good. And then you could basically use this for anything at all. It could be to do with physics data or biology, or it doesn't matter. It's just a really nice way to represent JSON, uh, represent data and access it. Um, but for now, it's stack and ST isn't going away. So that's one limitation. Um, another thing that I can see, so the kind of faceted side is a bit of, is an add-on. And for now, um, I can't see a way of kind of dynamically reducing those facets and giving you, so given my current selection, what else can I choose? Uh, and just hide the options that you can't choose anymore because you've made a selection. I haven't yet seen a way to do that. And I'm sure there are other things as well, but these are the things that I've noted so far. Um, and maybe if you've got some, then we can add to this slide later. So now we're going to attempt a live demo. So let's uh, So this is our um, stack API. It is public. Um, so you can set, find it at api.stack.cda.ac.uk. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about what the kind of the back, the code that is serving this is, but it's based on fast API. And one of the things that fast API does really nicely is create this docs URL endpoint um, with an open API render of your API. So um, I'm actually going to dive away from this and go to the kind of pure JSON interface in a second, just because I've got saved links and it's easier to navigate if you're not going through a UI. Um, but we'll kind of follow what's here and I'll, I'll talk through the various parts of it from this view first. So this top section here and labeled default is your kind of basic stack. So you've got various things. The landing page gives you basic information about stack. So another thing that's really nice about fast API and this is I can click this try it out button and actually run it. Um, so the response from the kind of slash tells us a bit about what we're looking at here. So um, this is the Cedar stack API and we've got a description here saying this is an experimental server. The, co the content is subject to change. There's no guarantee of, of its uptime. Literally, we could change it all and it will break and we're not guaranteeing any, any existence of this server, but um, hopefully it should be semi-stable at least. You then have a list of uh, conformance classes. So part of stack, like I said, is, is very extendable and this allows you to inform your clients what you are actually conforming to, what rules you're following. So there's the kind of core stack stuff in here um, surrounding things like, yeah, so stack core, stack item search, those are basics. And then this extra stuff down here is stuff that we've added on. Uh, and I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. And then the rest of it is links to various other places. So um, you can link out to collections, which we'll look at in a second. They've got this docs page. Uh, there's an actual API endpoint that just gives you that list of conformance classes at the top. So if you were make, make, making a client, you can just hit that endpoint, find out what the server can do, and then your client can display relevant content. Um, then it talks about all the actual, all the collections available. So um, we've got various collections here, we've got CMIP5, we've got FAM, which is uh, atmospheric aircraft monitoring. We've got Sentinel-5, Sentinel-1. Um, these are just kind of placeholders for now. They've got content in, but not much. So that's the kind of landing page. That's what you get picked up. I mentioned this conformance here gives you just that list of conformance classes. So like I said, if you're building a client, you probably want to look at this to make sure you could give the, the right capability to your user. And then um, probably the next useful thing is search. So uh, if I think straight to So slash search with obviously search this is your response. And this is guess your first first item. So that search is item search. Richard, sorry, you're you're breaking up on us a little bit there. 
I, I just checked that wasn't only me. Did did other people lose Rich's audio a bit there? I was losing his audio as well. Okay. I'm not, yeah, so that culprit can't put that. Say something again, Richard. Am I breaking up now? Yes, I am. You are you are slightly. Um, let me try. What if I change to using my laptop microphone? Is that better? That sounds fine at the moment. Yes, that's good. I've now lost your voice. Hello, hello. Sounds good. Now it's your turn to say something. It's good. I can't hear you. But you, you sound absolutely fine now. Right. Removing headphones. <laughs> we'll, we'll go with that. Um, we can, where, we can hear you fine. Hear. What was the last thing you heard? Um, good question. You were, I think, I think just as you came on to this, this okay. page as you loaded it that was where it's it broke up okay so this is the this is the search endpoint um this is item search so this is this is that really nice feature of stack that flattens um everything that's in a hierarchy into one level um so this is when we said we said meaningful groups of data this is what you're searching here and this is your first view of what a stack item might look like so um if I scroll here, so we've got uh, an ID which identifies this particular item. This tells us which collection it's part of. So uh, this is a thing that you can link out to. And this is your facets here. So um, we're looking at a CMIP5 file. Um, we've got various facets like Institute, Model, Realm. These are all things you can search on. And then we've got links out to other things. So um, here we are linking, linking to this thing itself. Here we're linking to its parent collection. So you can go and investigate kind of higher up this. You found an object. Maybe you're now interested in everything else that relates to it. So you can jump up a level. Um, and then in the just talking about how you would show different files. So this is where your assets come in. So here we have. This, in this case, we only have one data file linked to this stack item, but there could be more than more than one asset here. And in this case, it's a NetCDF file, and if I click this link, it would download that data and, and give me access to it. So that was search. Um, we saw the collection. So this is kind of giving you a top level view. So if I... Um, Go back to this view and type in collections at the top here. Then we see all the available collections. So, um, I mean, a JSON isn't particularly pretty to look at. It's very useful if you're a computer. Um, but there are your collections, and you can kind of dig down the tree. So, you this gives you all your collections. You can then um, Look at a specific one if you give it an ID. Then you can see the items that are part of that collection with this one. And then this one up here with an item ID gives you the item from that specific collection. So uh, to kind of give a, a prettier, more user-friendly way of seeing things, I'm going to go to our front end, which uh, Reese has been making. So this is the equivalent of the slash search endpoint. Um, and here you see all those are stack items and you've got their facets here uh, and you could click down and see more information about it. So this one has one asset. Here are all its facets. Um, this is the equivalent of the slash collections endpoint. So if you look at the URL, it follows the stack API as well. So it is, shouldn't be confusing and you could cut and paste from one to the other and you'll, you'll get there. Um, so this is just showing all of our collections uh, and you could drill that into each one and, and then it shows you all the items and that kind of thing. So I think that's all I wanted to show you on the, for now for the Stack API. Do you have any questions about Stack? 
Um, so we've, we've had a question come in. Are the endpoints slash search and slash collections defined by stack, the stack spec or by the via, via our API? They're defined by the stack spec. So I think actually there's a thing about slash search where other people have commented that they prefer it to be different and, it, and that, that it's not very restful. Um, so I think there is an issue somewhere which says something like they're not really precious about slash search. Um, but that's the kind of generally agreed convention for now. But yeah, all, all of these endpoints here listed in this default section are defined by the stack API specification. Thank you, Richard. Um, Richard, I think it might be useful to um, linger slightly on the on a collection on a specific collection document, just to show that that's that's where all the facets are defined for a given collection, and therefore how that that maps to a an activity like CMIP six or CMIP five or Cordex or something. Yeah, so that's not in, I, I, I guess I kind of agree with that statement, but also slightly disagree. Okay, sorry. Um, I will see if I've got a, right. So the facets are defined on an item. So here is an item from our collection. It's got a, a long, ugly string as its ID, but this is an item from our collection. Um, we are looking at, uh, a CMIP6 object here. We've got this uh, methane file, looks like. Um, and here are our facets. At the collection level, it is a summary of all the facets from all the items that are members of that collection. So um, here we have what a collection looks like. So a collection has uh, a title, has a description, you can ascribe keywords to it. Um, and then it has this section called summaries. And this is basically just aggregating all the values from all the items. So um, for now, we have only got one product here, which is I've got one. And it's just to build this list of um, values. So variables is uh, overwhelming. So I'm going to hide that one. <laughs> But yeah, so you can see here, we've got product, there's one value, experiment, one value, uh, realm, we've got multiple here, and we've got different ensemble members, and we've got different CMIP tables, and these are just essentially summarizing the items that are contained within the CMIP collection. I hope that makes it clearer. CMIP 5 collection, but yes. Uh, yes, CMIP 5 collection. And you're gonna you're gonna come on to talk about queryables, aren't you? Yeah. So I I have been ignored them for now because they are an add-on. Okay. Yeah. Um, Stefan has asked, can a stack API search call, call return a static stack catalog describing all matching items? So could the response to a search give you back a kind of static catalog? Um, I would think probably not. I would think the point of the API is that it returns you something which is dynamic. Um, so it, it will look the same as a static catalog. Like this, this response here is what your static catalogs would look like. Because um, they are, it's a stack collection and a stack item It's all the same but your, that content is, is, it, it, could, it could change because it's just representing what's in the database. I don't know. Right. We're, we're getting a good flow of questions now. So yeah. for the, I suppose just to make sure that, that we've answered that last one properly. So is, is the response from search a stack catalog instance by definition? Or is it just a search response um, that is a is a list of items? So okay, so from okay, so if using the slash search endpoint, probably you're just getting a list of items. Um, I suppose you could 
capture that as part of, and then this is potentially getting messy, you could capture that in a static catalog and say that this static catalog is has the items that are, are the results from this search. You could do that. Um, but it's probably a bit messy. I think there, there are two separate things. So the, the, the static stuff is about creating catalogs, collections, items, and assets as static JSON files and just linking between them using uh, URLs inside the JSON. And the API side of things is about returning um, search results and um, responding from a database rather than uh, a set of static files that haven't changed. Excellent. So I'll, I'll um, go slowly, so, slowly through these questions. Yeah. Um, so we have, what would be the actual difference between the summaries that you showed in the collection view yeah. and, and the queryables? So would they actually be the same thing in terms of content? Yes. Um, so actually, I'm trying to avoid queryables, but we could, we could do queryables. So uh, if I get this collection, which is uh, CMIP5, and I do queryables, then you get a queryable response, which is those same values, but um, using like an enum. So you have a, a title which gives it the name. This is the, um, if I go back, So you've got experiment here, that becomes experiment here. You can give it some kind of human readable title. You tell it what type is expecting, and then um, you provide an enum. So I think this is a JSON schema document that you're, you're returning here. And just to make sure I've understood this, this, am I right in saying this document is, is a way of finding out what you can search on, of what your facet, what your facet values are for a given collection. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So this is your in the open search world. This would be your description document for the collection. Excellent. Thank you. Um, another question: What's the potential for describing aggregations, i.e., multiple variables belonging to the same model and experiment, for example? Do you want to do you want to deal with that later? Because you you talk about aggregations a bit later, don't you? Um, not in. So is this this is about? Well, we haven't really talked about the problem yet, so I, I think that's probably not that question. So this is, I think, multiple variables belong to the same model and experiment. So if if you wanted to. Um, I don't know. We haven't really tackled aggregations ourselves. Um, I suppose if you if you wanted to create an aggregate item, then you could. Um, yeah. Maybe maybe one one of the responses to this question is that. Um, of course, we can consider any kind of level of aggregation through something like CMIP6. And what, what one of the things we're most after here is a, is a highly performant um, granular search. And so we've, we've decided a level that we think our, that makes sense for our items um, that is quite close to the level of the files, which are our assets. And in order to, uh, provide a consistent search across all of those and, and so we're talking what will be millions of items um, we we haven't tried to aggregate at a higher level we're, we're imagining that all that other ag well all of that gets dealt with by the faceted search in terms uh, of you could aggregate your res results together so if you if you're searching for multiple variables um, 
then you would just search multiple variables and then your results you could push together if you wanted to. I think that's probably what we've been going along the lines of. Yeah. So at the moment, out of interest, if can could you can we search for three variables in a single search? Or can we only search for a single value? I think you can do you could do an or search. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and last question for the time being. How is the process of generating the catalogues, especially for existing rather big archives? So that we will go on to next. Excellent. And and another question. Um, is there a way for a stack API call to return starting from a file name slash ID the value of its facets? Uh, no. So you if you had an ID, then you could return a stack item and then you could extract the facets. But I don't there's no like shortcut way, I don't think. Well, there isn't. E even though um because we put it all in Elasticsearch. Presumably, we have we have access to that through the Elasticsearch interface. Is that is that true that that we we'll, we have an ID we could look up directly in that respect? You could, but I mean, it's the same. You're still looking at a stack item, so it's the same thing. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay, thank you everyone for those questions. If if I've misrepresented any of those or or you've got further questions, just put them in the chat, but otherwise we will carry on. Okay. And I just say I what I propose is that maybe at, at half past two our time, we just have a 15 minute coffee break, let people recharge and just and then come back at quarter two. Sounds good. Right, slides up. So we talked about um, the kind of what the stack is, what it looks like, what what can it do, how does it work for us. Um, and as was asked at the end there, how what's it like indexing a huge archive of heterogeneous data? Um, and this is hopefully, this is what we're proposing is an answer to that question. Um, there probably are flaws in it. In fact, I know there are, um, but I'm hoping that with more heads, we can uh, fill those in and sort it out. But here we go. So this is, this is the stack indexing framework, which we've got so far. Uh, hoping to create a scalable solution for heterogeneous data holdings. So first of all, I'm going to kind of go through the requirements, what we're trying to create. Then I'll give an overview of the framework with a couple of diagrams and then give an indication of what an operational setup might look like. So first of all, um, we wanted it to be flexible. And when we say flexible, we were talking about it must need to be able to cope with many different data types. It must be able to work with different sources. So I said that we have a tape archive, a standard spinning disk archive, and we're starting to toy with object store as well for storing some of our data. Um, we, are, we, are plan we were hoping that it would work in different data centers. So we're hoping that you can take this framework and use it in your organization as well um, and make it work for you. And we wanted it to work. We wanted it to use a sort of plug and play architecture. So um, you can make it do whatever you need to do. Um, and this the thing I mentioned here is works with different output destinations. So we'll, we'll talk a bit about that in uh, a couple of slides time, but um, it needs to be able to write to disk or stand it out for debugging or a database or wherever you might want to put it. We wanted it to be easy to add new data sets. So um, at Cedar, we kind of have a, a different, we have a, a setup where we've got developers who are primarily involved in writing code for stuff and making services. And then we have data scientists 
who are involved in getting the data from scientists themselves, making sure it meets various standards, um, creating ingest pipelines and getting that from our kind of arrival area into the, the CEDA archive. And um, as developers, we don't really know much about the data. We know that it exists. Um, we might know some information about it from doing stuff before, but we're not up and close with the data like the data scientists are. They tend to have specific projects that they look after. So they know where the metadata lives. They know which metadata is important for their users. Um, so the goal was that non-developers can add support for new data sets as they come in through this, this framework. And as I mentioned in the first load of slides, we wanted it to be repeatable. So it must not rely on hand edits after the fact to correct things. So this is a really, really high level overview. Um, the asset scanner, which is what we've called it, uh, naming things is hard. So um, that's what I came up with. <laughs> um, it comprises of three main pieces. So on the left-hand side, we have inputs, input plugins. So um, we could have it just using disks. So things like uh, Python's OS Walk or something similar. So you're just creating a list of file paths. It could use um, intake catalogs to provide a list of input file paths. It could connect to some kind of queue system like Apache Kafka or RabbitMQ. Um, whatever you're trying to find. So this on the left hand side, you just have a list or a stream of um, file paths. You then put it through some kind of intermediate process, uh, which we've called the extractor. And that um, takes that file path, does something to it, and produces some kind of uh, JSON output document. And um, that feeds in into an output plugin, which can put it anywhere. So um, you could dump to terminal just to verify that it's done what you're expecting. You could dump to Postgres, or you could dump it to files on your, on your disk, or um, we're using Elasticsearch, so you could put it in Elasticsearch, or you could put it into another queue to do something else with. The point is that you can kind of define how things get into the extractor and then where things go when they leave. Um, and it's all very flexible. So that link at the bottom there is a link to the documentation for the asset scanner. And that links out to all the other things that we'll talk about as well. Um, so that's the starting point, really, if you want to dig into what we've been doing here. So a little bit deeper into this, this kind of workflow. Um, the asset scanner is designed to operate on single objects. So a single file or a single S3 object. And each object enters the framework as a string. So that could be a file path or a URL. Um, another thing to say, this could be used for more than just stack. So it receives a file path it will do some processing and create uh, a Python dictionary. And um, you could use this in any workflow where you're wanting to create like a fasted search where you're trying to extract metadata from files. Um, so yes, you can stick it out into something that looks like stack, or you could um, use it to create static stack catalogs, or you could use it to create any other kind of fasted search um, as long as you then manipulate that output. So. Yeah, it's a, it's a framework that has an in and an out, and then you can do whatever you want with it afterwards. So to kind of explain what's going on, um, we've got a set of files here on the left-hand side. We've just got a, a list of files. We then put it into our um, extractor. So the first what type of extractor here is an asset generator, and it's going to create assets. That then goes into an asset database. The same list of files also goes to the item generator and goes into an item database. So um, we're using Elasticsearch to, to provide our back end for Stack. And um, it just seemed to make sense when we were thinking about it to have these things all separate. So I think. Um, there is a Postgres backend for the API server, and you would create your assets 
as part of your stack items. They're kind of listed, they're nested inside the item, and then you store it that way. Um, we've separated it. Uh, it seems to work so far. Opinions maybe would be useful later on. But yeah, you put in your list of files, you put it through the your generators, they spit out some uh, a dictionary, and then you can store that dictionary in a database. So that takes care of the assets and the items part of stack, but then we've got this collections bit, and this works slightly differently. So um, whereas the assets and the items are generated from a stream of files, collections is kind of a summary. So what we do is we go back after the fact and we summarize what's in the, the item database, and that generates our collections. So I mentioned that there are various, it's a kind of pluggable architecture. This next diagram kind of shows what plugins we have at the moment. So on the input side, we've got POSIX, which is essentially using Python's OS Walk. We've got an object store plugin, which uses um, FS spec and Boto3. We've got an intake plugin, which reads from intake ESM catalogs. And I'll show you a demo later of, of one doing that. And um, we also have a rabbit plugin, uh, which reads from a rabbit queue to provide that kind of stream of file files. On the output side, it's very simple. So we just have standard out, which prints the screen so you can see what's going on, and Elasticsearch, because that's where we're putting it. Um, we also then came up with this kind of idea of a filter. So let's say you wanted to modify what was coming in from your input stream you can add in this filter. So um, if you wanted to ignore files with a particular ending or something like that, then you could do that. But it's all kind of, you can make these different plugins and you can connect them all together to, to, provide, to create a workflow that produces what you want. So here is an example configuration. Um, everything is done using YAML files. So here we're looking at a, um, the item generator. And we'll talk a bit about item descriptions next. But they provide, um, they tell the, the item generator what to do in the middle. So you, you receive a file, and you're spitting out some a dictionary. The item descriptions files, they define what happens in the middle and what actually gets done to the files. Um, here we're saying what inputs we want. So we want to use the file system input, and we're just going to do an OS walk on this path. And an output, nice and simple, we're just going to say dump it to standard out so we can have a look. So this would be if you're debugging or developing a workflow for a particular data set, then you might have a file that looks a bit like this. I mentioned item description, so that's this second line here. Um, again, names are hard, and perhaps we will change this name because it's becoming um, a bit more, a bit further reaching than just items. But these documents are YAML files that describe how to process the files within a data set, uh, within a data set and extract the facets. Um, so, and all applicable descriptions are merged to form one. So this is, this means that you don't have to redefine information that's in a higher level. So. Um, if I go back to this screen here, we've got this file path, BADC fam data. Maybe there are some generic things that apply to everything in the BADC directory. So you can have a file there. And then maybe your fam data has additional information. And you would define a description file here. And the files from these two points would get merged together to form one description. That's probably. Um, I might have gone over some people's heads, but hopefully that, that means it's less writing <laughs> to, to achieve the same result. Um, and the reason we have these things is but these files is because facets have multiple sources. So um, you might be able to extract facets from the file path. You might be able to extract facets from the file name. It all depends on kind of your, your naming conventions. Um, it might be you need to grab stuff out of the headers. So for NetCDF, they usually have quite rich headers. 
um, it might be the information you need is stored in there. Um, and it could be that you have external sources you want to read in to pull in your, your extra, your facets. So these description files are a way of describing for a particular data set um, given by a, a hierarchical path um, what to do to extract the facets. Just checking if there are any questions. Yeah, I don't have any, can't see the screen. No, no, no nothing at the moment. Okay. Um, another reason for these files is sometimes the content that you get out of these places actually can be wrong. So in, uh, we have a project for the climate change initiative where um, I've, one example was the product version which comes out of the file reads 0 0.1, but the product version for that set of data is actually 0 0.2. So um, the files are not always correct, and sometimes you have to do some tweaks. So these description files allow mechanisms to, mo to modify stuff as well. So we talked about we don't want to do hand handcrafted edits after the fact. Um, these description YAML files kind of feed into this workflow and hopefully you can encode those edits that you would do by hand afterwards. Sometimes content can be mixed with other content. So um, example for that, again, CCI, because it's the one I'm more familiar with. In the NetCDF header, you might get more than one institution labeled um, together. And sometimes they're delimited by a semicolon. Sometimes they're delimited by a slash. It's kind of hard to tell. So data is messy. And hopefully you can encode in this YAML file what to do with that messy data. Sometimes you might have missing data, um, so you need to provide some kind of default. And sometimes you might have mislabeled data where um, you're trying to match a controlled vocabulary, for example, and the file header, the metadata in the file doesn't match that controlled vocabulary. So yes, you can put it out, you know what it means, but maybe you need to rename what that particular facet is before it can go into your stack system. The description files allow you to define processing workflows to extract data along with defaults and overrides. So they take care of the use cases from before. And the description files apply to all data under their specific path, not covered by another description file. So we're going to look at what a description file looks like here. So this is the kind of basics of a description file. At the top here, you have this data sets key, and this is a list, and it defines all the hierarchical paths that are um, taken care of with this, this workflow. This FASIX key, then uh, followed by the extraction method, this is the kind of way to it. This is how you tell the processor what to do and how to get your, met your, your facets out. So we've got um, a simple regular expression here. Um, I'll start with the bottom one, actually. This is a simple regular expression, which is just using the file path. So remember, what you get in is a file path. And this is just pulling stuff out of that file path. So we can get the platform, for example, and the flight number out of our file path. Um, here we are, the second regular expression. We're looking at the file name. So we've also got this concept of pre and post processes. So pre-processors will modify the input to the processor and post-processors will modify the output. So here our pre-processor just takes the path and turns it into a file name. So I think it uses um, os.path split text or something like that, just to grab the file name out. <clears throat> and then we're performing a simple regular expression to grab the date time stamp out of that file name. Um, we're then passing it into this post processor, which converts that string into an ISO dated formatted, uh, ISO formatted date. Um, and we're telling it to use the date time from the output from this regular expression. So there's a lot of stuff happening here. <coughs> Excuse me. But hopefully you can kind of see how it's working. So we've got a file path. We're pulling out platform and flight number. We're getting the file name. We're pulling out. We're, we're converting it to just a file name. We're pulling out date time. We're then converting that into an ISO date using the key date time, which is the output from here. So hopefully you, you followed that. 
And then this bit at the bottom is the aggregation facets. So I said that these workflow, this works on an atomic level, so file by file. Um, and this leads to one of the problems we'll talk about later on. Um, but you put in a file, it will do a processing, do some processing on it and pull out various things and it will output some JSON. And you want things that would be in the same item to be grouped together. So your files, you're putting in files, so files are assets. You want those assets to be grouped. And what these aggregation facets do is kind of like a DRS. So a DRS describes a data set and you're saying that files that come through here that have the same platform and the same flight number will end up as one stack item. So the values from platform and flight number, they get hashed to form an ID and that forms your item ID. That's a kind of a key point. So just check that everybody, everybody gets that. Is it worth just saying it again, Richard? Yeah, okay, so we're putting in files. Files are assets. We want those assets to be grouped together under an ID. So if you've got a time series, you want all the files in that time series to be part of one stack item. But because we're putting them through one by one independently, we need a way of calculating what the ID will be when it comes out the other side. So we put in, a file, it pulls out some facets. This aggregation facets key here says that everything, every file that comes through and I can pull out a, a platform and the flight number and they are the same, they get generated the same ID and they will then end up as the same stack item. So it's a deterministic process for calculating your, your item IDs. You put in a file, as long as it's got the same facets as another one, they will end up together. And so, Richard, to um, to put you on the spot and come back to one of our early requirements, um, one of the things we want is to be able to reprocess, you know, regenerate. Um, let's let's imagine that that some bit of the metadata gets updated, and that affects the deterministic. The, the algorithm that generates the IDs. Um, at that point, do we have to do, is our process to just regenerate the catalog records? Um, that's one we haven't solved yet. Um, that should probably go in our, one of our later, haven't done yet things. Um, but yes, you'd have to build some kind of um, process for updating stuff so that you would uh, remove objects. So it might be you end up with, we probably end up with orphaned stuff so maybe items without any assets would become deleted every now and then garbage collected something like that but yeah you'd have to have some kind of process that will clean up because as you say if you change the value of one of these or add an additional aggregation facet then they'll end up somewhere new and you'll end up with an orphaned item yeah that's that one of the potential problems Uh, I'd say the reason we've kind of gone with this approach, um, we initially were thinking about, um, because quite often you don't need to read all the files to understand, because you're going to be, if, you're, if you've got a time series, you only need to read the first one and the last one, because everything else will be the same. The only thing that's different is the dates. So we were initially thinking that we'd have to build some kind of way of saying, for this data set, you read first and last, and then off you go, that's all we need. Um, but that kind of requires a, that's a kind of top down approach where you have to know what's there first and you have to run it periodically and you have to know things. If stuff is being ingested into the archive, you kind of have to go back retroactively and fix those particular parts. Um, so the reason we've kind of gone from this bottom up asset approach is because it works nicely with our ingest stream where we can just feed off what's happening with indexing into the archive and then we just grab that file as it comes in and we can pull it out and it will then get kind of assigned to the relevant items so that's why we've gone from this approach um it definitely adds messiness but hopefully it solves other messiness 
So let, let you be the judge. <laughs> right. So we're going to move on. So I kind of kind of talked about a bit about them already, but I'm going to dig deeper a little bit. So the asset scanner provides the framework that provides the input, the bit in the middle and the output, and it provides sort of base classes and um, a pattern to follow. But um, creating the content for stack is done using implementations of the base extractor, which is a class defined in the asset scanner. So these have become three packages and we've called them generators um, to kind of give them a, a consistent name. So the asset generator makes assets, the item generator makes items, and the collection generator summarizes the items to create collections. Um, and the last point there, so the facet, the, those are all links. So when we'll circulate the slides later, but all those, if you click on them, that takes you to the GitHub repo and you can look at the code. Um, but the facet section from the item description defines the extraction workflow for the item generator. So that's what I described in the last, last slide. And um, the extraction methods, they link out to named entry points uh, in Python, which makes it easy to extend. So if you've got a different workflow, you can create a little Python package that um, defines a named entry point, and then you can use it in this workflow. So you don't have to use all the same things that we are if you've got different uh, use cases or different needs, you can either extend what we've got and make pull requests, or you could um, make your own packages and then use them yourself just by installing it with the same kind of namespace and entry points. Um, question here, CMIP6, how long does the OS walk method take? Uh, we've not done it for all of CMIP6, but um, a little while. <laughs> um, the idea is hopefully you only need to do that once. I, th I think also, um, Kevin, one, one of the issues with that is that um, on our system, we already have, we have, we have auditing processes in place which keep track of all the files we've got. We already, for, for other reasons, had already put, created a, an elastic search index of all, all our files. So, um, potentially we wouldn't be doing the OS walk ourselves. And, and I imagine other organizations on the call might already have, you know, something you've cataloged that you can provide as a, an input plug into, to avoid having to do that. Yeah, what you need is a list of file parts. So any way you can get that, you don't have to OS walk it. Um, yeah, you could, as I said, there's a, one is an in, input intake catalog, which we'll look at. So that's already a file that you could read and, and pull stuff out of. Um, but yeah, if you've got a list of files somewhere else, then go ahead and use that. And, and you yeah. followed up with, do you have to rerun if you update files? Um, so I suppose it, it depends what updates. Um, one of the things that we have in place in our ingest system is that we have a set of workers um, and rabbit queues to to support new stuff coming in so so yeah we would have we would have these workers that would get kicked off to generate new items and new assets according to new files that have come in yeah so there is a slide on the kind of operational stuff but yeah we would we basically just have rabbit queues and we'd shove in we'd just put that back in the top and it would have filtered down through the system we don't have to worry about um looking after it pretty much and um, um, Matteo has asked, is it possible to know which were the items that were problematic or were skipped during the pipeline execution? That's a good question. That is a good question. Um, that probably just depends on your logging. So you could, if you had uh, logging that would output that information and captured that log somewhere, then that's probably the only way to do that. Like I say, because we're trying to do this alongside uh, an operational ingest, then we can't stop and wait. So you'd have to gather that information somewhere else and process it again later. Um, um, when, we, when, when developing these workflows, we've tended to do uh, standard out on a small subset, 
maybe 10 files or 30 files, check that it's doing as you behave, expand that to a slightly larger selection, and then uh, we tend to just to go for it. <laughs> um, and most of the time it's worked out okay. Haven't have really had missing things, but yeah, that, that is always a fun one, tracking down those missing things. I guess we're not also, we're not necessarily aiming for 100% perfection in the catalog here. We're just trying to do as much as we can get reasonably. Um, so this isn't a 100% reflection of the Cedar archive. It's a um, doing our best to show metadata for things that we can. And at this point, given that we are, we were just having a bit of a discussion um, before moving on, I promised everyone that we could, we could have a 15 minute coffee break at this point. And having promised that, I want to um, make sure I honor it. So I suggest we have a pause. Um, yep. Feel free to stay on the line if you want everyone, but I'm, I'm gonna mute and switch my video, video off for a while and just um, go and get a drink. So. I suggest we all do the same and then meet back here in quarter of an hour to carry on. If there's there are no immediate questions, then I'll just ask Richard to carry on. Yeah. <clears throat> Let's do that. So I'm just going to go back a slide to kind of reorient and then we'll carry on. Um, so the, the key thing to say is we're going on to talk about uh, the kind of the bit in the middle, so we're, that diagram we saw at the beginning, we've got inputs, something in the middle, outputs. This is what takes place at that something in the middle. Um, and we've created three packages that kind of fill that gap. So an asset generator, item generator, and collection generator. Um, I'm going to go into the item generator first, just because we've kind of talked about item descriptions. Um, so it might make more sense straight up and then I'll do the asset and the collection generator after that. So onto the item generator, I was saying that the extraction methods that we have in our um, configuration file, or the item descriptions, they relate to named entry points. So you can easily extend how the code works, um, add additional processes. So this screen grab here is from the setup.py, and it just shows you all the, the ones we have so far. So we've got uh, a regular expression, which can just grab content from strings. We've got header extract, which operates on uh, anything that can be handled by X array. So mostly aimed at NetCDF files to start off with. Um, the other two, perhaps uh, a bit more niche, it was more things that we were playing with, but there is a, a method to extract data from an ISO 19115 record or a generic XML file. So uh, in this in the context of Sentinel, a lot of the metadata is held in this manifest XML file. So that's where that gets used. Um, the here, the next level down, we've got backends for the header extractor. So either using X array or CF Python. And then we saw before in our a description file here, we've got these pre and post processes. Those names link out to the pre and post, pre and post processes here. So we've got one way of uh, changing the file path into just a file name to make it easier to write your regular expressions. Um, Cedar observation, you can probably ignore. That was a thing that I had to play with. It was talking, going to use the Cedar catalog that we have and pulling stuff out of there, but that's probably not relevant for most of you. Um, but it just shows that you could use an external resource like some other catalog that you already have to kind of uh, pre-populate and initialize your content here. And then pro post processes, we've got an ISO date processor, which converts a date into a um, ISO date format. Um, facet map is about changing things. So um, if you had um, a value that came out with the wrong name, then you could use this post processor to swap the name. B box one is about converting formats or bounding boxes. So um, Elasticsearch expects a particular format and Stack expects a different format. So it's about converting between those two. String join is just uh, about joining values together. So if you've got, uh, for example, you might have a date, for example, that's spread across multiple directories. So 
quite often we have you know a year directory a month directory and a day directory with the data files inside and you might want to use that year month day to form your date time um, you can either use the string join and the iso date together to kind of make a date for you or the last one the date combinator is basically just joining those together but all that stuff is in the documentation um, with explanation of what they do and how to use them and the various uh, configuration options you've got for each one. I guess I'll go back on the left hand side here. I've written outputs two things. So in most cases, they output one document, uh, one dictionary, but the item generator outputs two. That's just to kind of perform the linkage. So the asset generator will make an asset that goes in the asset database, but it doesn't know about the item at this point. The item generator um, produces an item ID and it produces two outputs one of them is the item metadata and the other one is an asset um object that has uh, the item id in it i'll show you when we well, i'll do a live demo in a second and i'll point that out so it becomes a bit more obvious what's happening the asset generator is currently written to extract the kinds of things that we thought were important so um what you think is important might be different but the things we're pulling out our name the extension, the size, the last modified time, and the magic number to get a sort of file type. And we currently have handlers for POSIX, so traditional disk, and object store using FSSpec. Lastly, we have the collection generator. This is very much a work in progress. It's kind of a, a thing we're building, um, and that means other things are changing as well. So initially when we first put it together that content i showed you earlier with the collections that was handcrafted so um i would go into elasticsearch and i would create a collection object i'd give it an id and a description and a title and then uh, we used some other process to do the summaries um the collection generator is aiming to kind of replace that so um in one of the earlier diagrams, I had this kind of link. So you send in the files, you create your assets and your items, and then after the fact, you go back and you summarize those using the collection generator. So this is work in progress. Um, it's not currently in the documentation, but it will be included once it's more stable. Like I said, it works a bit differently. Instead of working with a stream of file names, it works as a summarizer of the previously generated content. So. Time for a demo. Fingers crossed this works. So this is a little repository that I put together to kind of demonstrate um, this framework, generating assets and items in a place that you would be able to play with it. So um, it works on Binder. So I'll just click the launch finder button once I find my mouse. Hopefully, because I ran it earlier, it should be quick to start up. So we're dropped into that repository and binder. Um, the first thing I'll show you is the configuration. So this is kind of the setup. So I'm going to look at the asset one. The item one is basically exactly the same. Um, here I've defined what extractor I'm using. So here I'm using the asset extractor. It's also worth noting that that's optional. So if you have your Python environment and you've installed the asset generator um, library, then it automatically assumes that's what you want. If you've got more than one installed, then it's a bit of a problem, but it will use the entry points and just pick the first one that it finds but you can define it in this file as well i'm telling it where my descriptions are found we'll have a look at that in a second and i'm going to use the intake esm input so this is just using an intake catalog stored on github for cmip6 um, i'm telling it the column where i want to grab my uri uri from so this is uh in inside this document i don't know if it's worth me heading there briefly let's uh, use this one 
so I've got a does it get the common name? Yeah, common name is our path. So our path is the path to the ZAR file. Um, so I'm just using that as a column selector. And because I don't want to have loads of data back, I'm actually going to do a search. So this uses the intake ESM library to perform a search. And I'm just sticking a load of keyword arguments in here to, to reduce how many files I get back. So in this case, I'll only get back two. And that's nice and easy for a demo. Um, but yeah, so that it gives you the capability. You're right? You can search in the, an intake ESM catalog uh, and that then use that to create your stack items. Output, I'm just going to send it to standard out so we can look at it. And um, I've just defined a logging level of info. Like I said, the item one looks exactly the same apart from it says item generator, facet extractor instead of asset extractor. So they're basically the same thing. Right. So that's the configuration. So we've seen our inputs and our outputs. The next thing we're feeding in is our descriptions. So this is our workflow. So I'm saying that for this particular, so this is, this is our um, object store URL. This is our bucket. Um, and I'm saying that everything that is found at this path, I want this workflow to apply to. And the workflow is nice and simple. I'm using a regular expression. And you're allowed to write a description. That just gets ignored, but it might be easier for people to look at later. And I'm extracting facets from the path using a regular expression. So here's my regular expression. I can pull out the MIP era, activity ID, institution ID, and so forth. And I'm using those these facets here to say that these things appear as one item. So everything with the same MIP era, activity ID, institution ID, source ID, table ID, variable ID, and version all end up as one stack item. OK, so that's the kind of setup. We've got our configuration to define our inputs and outputs. We've got our item descriptions to describe our um, workflow of how to interact with our data. Um, this example notebook here just has, um, I'm going to restart and clear so that it's, uh... yeah, so this is just running as if you were on the command line. Um, so this. If you're not familiar with notebooks, this exclamation here would be the same as running this in your terminal. So asset scanner is a program that gets installed when you in install the asset scanner. Um, so I'm saying asset scanner, I'm providing my configuration, which tells it my inputs, outputs, and where to find my workflows. And if I run that, it's opening my intake catalog. It's found two two things in it and it, off it goes. So um, they're a bit messed up with the uh, logging output, but here is my asset. So it's made an ID for that asset. It says it's on object store. This is where you'd find it. This is the name of the file. It's a czar file and it's categorized as data. And same for the, the second one. So I've got a different ID because it's a different, different object and everything else is basically the same. So that's the asset scanner. Um, oh, sorry, the, yeah, the asset scanner, but it's doing the asset generation. If I want to run it for items now, so this is me getting out facets, it will do the same thing. So open the catalog, find two items, and then splurge some stuff. So here, I said I pointed out, um, there's a dictionary here, and a second dictionary here. The first one is your item output. This is your item metadata. So we've got a item ID and we've got um, some facets. So they've all been pulled out. And then we've also got this object here, which goes into our asset. So the asset, um, this asset here, 0B747, gets given the item ID here. So this basically links it up. So when you're searching Elasticsearch, um, you get an item back and you say, give me all the assets, then it will go off and search for all the assets that have this item ID. Um, and the same here, we've gone out and we've pulled out our facets. 
and we've got our additional ID here as well. Do we have any questions at this point? Nothing comes through at the moment. Okay, so this is this is something you can go off and play with. Um, the data is all publicly available. The um, catalog is publicly available. So you can go off and, and change things if you want to do and see the difference. Uh, Richard, I've, I've just spotted that in the, I've, I've just pulled it up on Binder myself and it works. The only thing is that um, in the README, Asset Scanner has a hyphen. So I'm, I'm putting in a pull request for that. Okay. <laughs> but it's, it's working, so that's great. Good. <laughs> Go back to the slides. There's just one more, one more slide. So I said we kind of show about an operational architecture. Um, so this is kind of how we envisage using it at Cedar. We have a rabbit cluster um, where we have an exchange, and we send in our list of files. So that could be um, from the currently existing uh, ingest pipeline, getting data into the archive or it could be from a script that submits a load of stuff to this queue. So um, either you're doing an OS walk and submitting, or if you've got some other listing for auditing purposes, you might just splurge that in. Um, and that goes into two queues. They, all of these things end up in both. Then we would have some consumers running on Kubernetes in Docker containers. So these are just running the asset generator and item generator code and they consume the uh, files from these queues and spit out uh, dictionaries. And they push them into Elasticsearch. So we've got an index for our assets and an index for our items, and these directly talk to these indexes. So we configure that with our, with our configuration file, our output would just be Elasticsearch output, and then we could uh, give it information about you know um, credentials and stuff for access to write. Then we have a collection generator on some kind of timed schedule. So um, you could do that with cron or uh, you could use a CI pipeline or something similar, a, a timed CI pipeline that will go every, I don't know, every day or whatever and uh, summarize the information in your item and asset indices and then put that back into a collection index. So that's kind of how we see it working operationally. Um, like I said, the input to this first blob, blob here is either the kind of indexing pipeline we have already with our ingest um, or being pushed in by people running scripts and shoving the information in there. That's it for this set. Any any questions on on that sort of indexer backend stuff before we move on to the final slide set and then towards a discussion? Okay, Francis, you're using Intake ESM. I think that was um, as you referred to before. How long does an OS walk take for CMIP six? We have people who have object store. Um, CMIP6 on object store, and they've already made an intake catalog. So it would seem kind of, and we, we know that object store, if you're trying to walk an object store, that's really slow, even slower than on a file system. So it's, it's using an existing list of stuff that you know that you have to feed it rather than trying to generate that list again. So that's the point of it. It was more because we knew that there was there were people who were interested that had catalogs and it was a kind of showing them that you can use this with your existing intake catalogs and it it not be a big burden yeah i mean for us because we um because we have this ingest 
already we just use that and the rabbit cues um it depends on it, it all depends on what what you have already so if you don't have an intake catalog then you wouldn't do it that way um and if you yeah it, it whatever whatever makes the most sense for what you've got i think is the take home message and you can make a plugin for that is it's the classic there's an app for that it's uh, it's that kind of response there's a plugin for that if you want to if you want to do it a different way, then do it a different way. It doesn't matter. As long as you end up with a stream of paths to something and dump it somewhere else, then it doesn't matter where it comes from. I guess there's the danger of making something too flexible, so you actually make it um, too big to handle. But <laughs> in, in terms of that, point. Richard, in terms of that example on Binder, I yeah. suppose the, the, key, the key thing is that you can almost instantaneously parse that intake catalog and that, that's your inputs for your demonstration, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And it also means that you don't have to have any um, test data inside your Git repository on Binder. But it's and also, just... in theory, it means that I can follow whatever's there rather than worrying about um having to keep it up to date and stuff yeah yeah if the links change and the locations change it doesn't matter i just follow what's in the catalog okay on to zero on to oh three Yeah, apologies. I thought this was at 04, but there are still extensions to talk about, aren't there? Yeah. So this is the actual API. Um, there's not too much to this slide set, so we're nearly there. There's a lot of information. This is, I think, this 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 side. So that we've got two technical meetings, back end and front end. And I think it's very back end heavy because we haven't done that much in the front end other than make that uh, JavaScript client that I showed you earlier. So um, whereas on the back end, we've been very much doing our own thing, um, on the kind of server side, well, I say back end, I mean, on the indexing side, we've been doing our own thing. On the server side, um, we've been trying to leverage what already exists. So I, said, I mentioned at the beginning that ecosystem. Um, so basically, I just scrolled through that list of Python servers and found one that looked reasonably well established and started building on it. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about here. So we're going to talk a bit about the API server, which is an elastic search backend for an open source library and some additional extensions we've got. And then talk a bit about something that we're, we're starting. It's not super well defined, but about how to integrate vocabularies into all of this. So there's a quick, I say, I, I originally had this as a reminder, but I noticed there are points in here I didn't say before. So here's some new things about Stack. Um, <laughs> Stack is based on the OGC API features. So if you're familiar with that kind of um, specification, then that's where Stack started. Uh, extension of it is encouraged. It's very flexible and there's a strong extension community. I think I provide a link out to various places you can look for the extensions. Um, I mentioned before it requires temporal and spatial attributes, which can be a limitation. It's got this very flexible JSON format. So as long as it can be served by JSON, you can respond with it. And it's available as either static or dynamic. And we're focusing on the dynamic side. So um, we are using the Stack Fast API library. If this provides a load of um, it basically defines a fast API application with the URL endpoints that you saw earlier. Um, it provides a load of type and models and things and base classes to extend. Um, it also provides out of the box Postgres and SQL Alchemy backend. 
So if that's what your databases are, then it's good to go. Um, but because we're using Elasticsearch and there are things that we wanted to do that required Elasticsearch or were better than Elasticsearch, we've developed Elasticsearch backend, which was relatively straightforward. It just kind of um, plugs in and extends the classes that already existed in this framework. Um, we have been making quite a lot of changes to the Stackfast API in, in response to my experience trying to extend it with Elasticsearch. So there were various things that were um, independent of the back end, but had been woven into the back ends, for example, which we pulled out. And um, there were lots of sort of hard coded extensions. Um, and I've got a pull request at the moment, which is nearly, nearly merged, um, which is to try and make all of that dynamic. So if you add an extension, then it will um, automatically populate that kind of documentation page with the any additional arguments that it adds and things like that. Um, whereas before you'd have had to override a class and redefine stuff. So hopefully that's nicer. They seem to think it is. But we're contributing back to this repository as well. It's not we're not just forking it and leaving it. We're we're trying to move the standard forwards. Um, stack extensions. I think I said in the first one. There are two different types and I'm going to explain them now. So they fall into two categories. One of them is content and one of them is PPI. So on the content side, there are extensions for things like, so there's a processing extension, which gives you information about the processing level and provenance. So that would be for things like satellite imagery. There's a data cube extension, um, which some in this group may be familiar with, but I think that is, uh, has been developed to give things like variables and dimensions. So that might be something that people particularly in this group are interested in. Um, and there's loads of them. Um, I think, yeah, so at the end, I'll pop some links up um, where you can see a whole list of the community extensions for content that exist. Um, on API extensions, they usually extend functionality. So ones that we have used or are going to implement so filter, that is what gives you the queryables endpoint and enables more complex search. Um, context extension, so that gives you, uh, I'll show you an example in a minute, but that gives you things like how many results you have and um, what page you're on and that kind of stuff in your search response. That's not by default there. Um, sorting, that's an extension, which you can choose to enable or not. Uh, there's a, an extension for transactions, which is putting things in and deleting things. So um, particularly in the ESGF community, you, this might be useful if we move to stack as the API, then we could use the transaction extension to provide an API for um, publishing as well as serving the data. So that might be of interest to some. And these two links at the bottom link out to places you can find more information. So on the left, there's a whole um, organization around stack extensions with uh, many, I don't know, it's definitely in the order of tens, if not a hundred or more different extensions and explanations and various um, levels of maturity as well. And on the right, there's an API extensions document where um, there are some kind of clear mature ones and also community suggestions as well some of which we've contributed so these are the kind of ones that we've added in um, we added in the filter which i'll talk about in a second we've added free text search this was something we thought was really important um, by default stack doesn't support free text search so we've added in this definition of how that might work and then it's up to clients to understand it and use it. Um, we've added in context collections, which I'll explain why in a bit. And uh, we're in the process of adding the transaction. So first of all, filter. So this is what it does. It provides an expressive mechanism for searching item attributes. So for example, here, um, this is a get request. And you could say, uh, Give me, this is on your slash search endpoint. So slash search filter equals um, 
collection Landsat one. So you're asking from the Landsat collection, you're asking for, I think that's ground, or I looked it up earlier, ground surface something. Can't remember, it's a resolution thing for satellites. Anyway, um, you're looking for something less than 30, you're looking for something with cloud cover less than 10 over a particular date range and intersects your particular bounding box or geometry. You could, you could have any, any polygon there. So it gives a really rich way of uh, querying. Um, and that follows uh, OGC API features part three. So that's where it's come from using the common query language. So that's, that's the kind of background for this. It also adds queryables. So without this filter extension, you haven't got this queryables, which if you're familiar with open search is kind of like your description document and, and tells you what uh, facets you have available. So there are two endpoints to that. There's a slash queryables, which is global. And then there's a queryables for a particular collection. So this is what they look like. We saw them earlier. This is the queryables for a specific collection. And um, we're looking at uh, MIP area, activity ID, source ID, and it gives you the possible values for those facets. I think there's a zoom in. Yes, there is. There you go. So uh, source ID has three potential values and your front end, your client could understand that and present that to the user. Um, in terms of extension, another one we've got for free text. So this is one that uh, we've written at CEDA and it leverages the capabilities of Elasticsearch to provide free text search. So it's just using a query string and um, similar syntax as you might use with Google. Um, obviously it's the Elasticsearch syntax, but I think they try and keep them fairly consistent. So uh, you can put in any, any string. So here is Sentinel and it, it by default queries against properties. So this is the same as searching uh, properties.star. So any property contains the word Sentinel. Um, you can use quotes to give an exact match. So you're looking for the exact phrase climate model in the properties. Um, and there are various ors and ands you can add as well by changing what you're writing in this, in this query string. Uh, the link at the bottom there is the link out to the extension description. And, and that provides like a, an open API um, description of this endpoint as well as some readme text. Um, another one, so I, I haven't explained the reason for this, but I do later. So I'll try and explain it now and then you'll see it later and it will make more sense. Um, I said before, there are two parts to the queryables. One of this is this global and the second one is this collection one. The collection one is clear. It just grabs that collection and the information you saw in the summaries uh, earlier on, it displays that in the format that is required. Queryables at root level is a um, the intersect of the queryables that are available. So you can imagine if you've got Sentinel or satellite imagery and CMIT and um, observations, the intersect of that will be zero because they all have different vocabularies. And so there isn't one shared vocabulary. Um, and that is true. So if you go to our api.stack.cedar and do the slash queryables, you'll get nothing back because there is no intersect between CMIP5, Sentinel1, and FAM, and MODIS. They don't, they don't have anything overlapping. So you get zero. That's not very helpful. Um, and as I'll explain later in one of the problems, there is no concept of uh, the search. It doesn't know about the search when you do slash queryables. So my kind of way around that is to extend the context to describe the top 10 collections for your current search. So when you make a search, um, maybe I'll jump out to a, an example in a second, then your search results will contain items from collections and this extension says that you can return those collections in your response and then when you go to ask your queryables give me the queryables you can then provide it uh, several collections to intersect 
so that you don't have to insect everything, you're insecting the relevant information. I will, I, there'll be a diagram later that hopefully makes that clearer, um, but this is the solve that problem. And I uh, linked this issue here at the bottom. That is where I kind of announced that I, I was having a problem. And then I announced that I'd solved the problem. Um, and there's a bit of a discussion around it, but um, I'll let you go and have a look at that. We're then looking at transactions. So this is uh, supporting the creation, editing and deletion of items through post put patch and delete requests. So this is part of the standard um, extensions for stack. API. So you can create new things or delete things or update things, which could be really useful. And I was going to demo those things now. So let's do that. So I was going to explain a bit about the context extension. So if I go to the user interface, a friendly one. Right, so I'll do both. So if I do slash search, I get everything back. And um, there are loads of different, so if I scroll right to the bottom, in my context here, I've got my context collections extension, which is telling me that these collections are returned in my response here. And because I've searched on everything with no filters, then this is just all the collections that we have defined in our stack instance. So if you try and intersect those things together, you get no global facets that you can filter on. If I say, using the free text search that I'm interested in CMIPS. So I'm searching for CMIPS star up here. Then I'm only going to get things back from CMIPS 5 and CMIPS 6. And if I scroll right to the bottom, I have two collections. This is CMIPS 5 and CMIPS 6. And uh, this is when I remember whether there's actually anything in common between the two. Version is the only thing that's common between those two. Um, so here on the left hand side now, the facets are the intersection of those facets is version. So if I um, do another call, if I do query balls, collections equals, now I think I can just go that one. So this is what it's doing behind the scenes. So my search results have got two collections. I can then, it then does a call to the query was endpoint, specifying the collections. I think if I've done it right, yes. That returns with the intersect, which we know is just version. And that's what we're seeing in the user interface. If I type in Sentinel star, so Sentinel one and five, I think is what we've got. There are more things that overlap between those two, such as processing level and platform and product version. So that's a thing. Um, it's really useful. Um, and in the next few slides after the demo, we'll look at vocabularies and that's trying to make this more, more helpful, more user friendly. Um, so that's the uh, free text search, filters, context extension. I think that's everything. Any questions before I look at vocabularies? Chat says so there's two things. No, I, I, yeah, there's, there's there's no new questions in that. Yeah. Okay. And um, just right. my comment on that stuff. I hadn't appreciated you done that, and um, that looks really really useful. Yeah. Otherwise, you, there's an unsolvable problem. <laughs> yes, indeed. So <laughs> very nice. Um, Right, we'll go back to um, vocabularies. So you've seen the problem there where the intersect isn't necessarily very helpful. You've got um, collections with completely different vocabularies and it would be nice if you could kind of mesh those together. 
So um, the next section of things we're trying to figure out are how to, how to build these vocabularies together. So what do we want? We want to rationalize key facets at the top level, which we call the canonical entry facet. So things like source ID, it's a model. So we want to make sure that source ID shows up as a model and other things that are models are also showing up at the very top level. So when you appear at that blank page, you see down the left hand side, oh, here is a list of models that I could filter by. And you look down, you say, oh, this was one that I know that I want, click. And then you're automatically limited your search and found more useful information. Another thing we want to do is bring additional context to the user. So what does this facet or term actually mean? So if you're not familiar with the domain, things like um, source ID actually will make sense. Or um, I think uh, assignment variable names like uh, Tasmax and that kind of stuff. Uh, what does that mean? If you're not familiar with it, you wouldn't know. So we want to bring that additional context to the user. And we want to provide a controlled vocabulary to the indexing process. So we can potentially uh, be strict about what things we allow through at that indexing phase. So a user might be saying, what is source ID? What is access ESM1-5? I don't know, completely nonsense to me. So this is what this is about. And as I said, this is a work in progress. Um, we have only really been doing vocabulary stuff in the last month or so, and we're just kind of testing things out. But this is the kind of workflow we're thinking that we want to do at the moment. We've got these external vocabularies uh, out there. They might be in, on the internet as a vocabulary service. They might be in files somewhere. They might be handcrafted and specific to a domain. Um, they're out there in the world. Then we want to build a framework, which we're calling a vocab generator to follow the whole generator naming convention. We build these adapters that know how to talk to these external services. We munge them together with some kind of process when we're inputting our mapping. So we're saying, this is where we'd say source ID is a model and that's our kind of top level facet. And then we want to output a load of XML or RDF files, um, which contain that content. So um, we can then send that to some a server, a web API, which can then be used by users. So from your user, your, from your web interface, you would be able to hover over uh, the name and it would call out to this um, server and find the extra information about your particular term that you're interested in. So this is the kind of the high level view of what we're thinking right now. Um, Anything else to say on that ag vocabulary wise? Um, no, I don't think so. Okay. Any comments before we uh, do the summarization? Last slides and we summarize. Okay. So this is very much the kind of current state where we are now. Um, so we'll look at what haven't we solved? Kind of where we've got to with each thing and then it's up to us to have a really open discussion so um i mentioned earlier about if we're putting in things at the kind of bottom up level so we're getting we're getting individual files we're putting them through we're outputting individual um sort of json documents for each file and then trying to merge them together there's a problem with that how do we aggregate things nicely so that they um merge together and you've seen about queryables. Um, it would be really nice if you had next to that, if you click this button, there will be 50 results or, um, and then also have that dynamic. So you've, if you've selected a particular model, then some of the other facets might become irrelevant. At the moment, there isn't really a mechanism for that to be, to say that. So starting off with stream aggregation, this is an example which kind of highlights the point. Here we have two files that are part of the same time series, start date one day apart. So in your kind of result, you want to have uh, a start date with the lowest number and an end date with the highest number. We put them through our item generator. They each individually come up with a response. So we've got the same ID, ID one, because they're part of the same time series. 
and we have a start date for the first one, 2005, start date of the second one, 2006. All, all fine so far. We stick them in our database and we do a get on ID one. And obviously it's a race condition. It's whichever one went in last becomes the start date. Um, so that's potentially a problem, particularly for things like um, things with a time series. Um, but it could be the same. I think someone mentioned earlier about if you've got multiple values for the same facet, at the moment, the way that it works, that wouldn't work. You just get the last value. So we need some kind of layer in the middle, probably, to handle aggregating these objects together before they go in the database or have some way of, I mean, on a very basic level, you could do a, a get merge push. But um, yeah, basically everything I thought of came up with a race condition. So that's a, a fun challenge. And then the other one is queryable counts. So it'd be nice to know how many items match each facet. The problem is the API doesn't know the search context. So when you um, do a slash queryables or a collection queryables, you, it has no idea what you're actually after. Um, the queryables are taken straight from the collections without modification. So I showed you this kind of interface where you can provide the queryables, and this should totally hammer home exactly what's going on. So when you do this call, uh, you get the queryables from collection one, you get the queryables from collection two, you get the queryables from collection three, and this is the bit that comes back. So it's only the intersect, the shared queryables that come back. It doesn't perform a search. Um, and then when, when we're going down the specific uh, collection ID, then you get the queryables for that specified collection. Again, it has no idea what you're actually interested in. So here we have some kind of timeline things. Um, we started the indexer work in February 2021. Uh, first of all, we just started by trying to read POSIX and, and getting some facets out of it. Then we had a, a demonstration where we're looking at public object store on an S3 interface. Um, then we've got that demonstrator repo so that you could see it in action. And there's now an, a, a PyPy release for the asset scanner to make it easier to install and uh, with reasonable documentation about it as well. What we're kind of looking to do next is, um, I mentioned that I was handcrafting those collections. So we want to, in the same way we want a deterministic item ID, you want to have a deterministic collection ID with some kind of rule that we can set up. Obviously we want to increase our coverage. So at the moment we've just done a few key data sets with a bit of with differences so that we can try our approach with uh, different data and see what, what works and what doesn't. We'd like to link in our vocabulary server and work with that. Uh, and then probably we're gonna to have to figure out the stream aggregation problem and hook it up to live ingest as well. So that's that's kind of where we're heading for now with the indexer. Um, after the discussion, we may be heading somewhere else. We'll find out. The API again was similarly started in February. Um, first off, we started with just vanilla stack, so just the basic operations. Um, we built an automated deployment pipeline, stuck it up. Um, added some extra extensions like the context and free text and filters and the public release, which you've been seeing today at api.stack.cda. Um, and then in the future, we're looking at a dynamic search model. So that's that pull request I mentioned, where when you go to that docs page, it actually uh, changes depending on which extensions are enabled. We want to make sure we've got the transaction extension for the ESGF publisher purposes as a demonstrator. Um, we are currently operating off a fork from Stackfast API, but we want to try and use the upstream and not have to maintain our own copy. And then for ESGF, we want to have, we want to have a test AWS deployment, and then we'll be uh, using our live ingest stuff as well. Vocabularies, that's very recent, I said. I think we've only started since September, probably end of September. So we've just basically got as far as sketching out a workflow, trying some sample vocabularies and mapping to our kind of canon terms. Our source ID is the same as model, that kind of thing. 
uh, where next? We want to define what the web API looks like, develop a web server and deploy a limited example. So we've got uh, a full example from um, creating some vocabulary files, putting them on a server, making that live and being able to query it. And then it's just a case of extending that, expanding coverage to additional control vocabularies and then link it into our ingest system and uh, the user interfaces and stuff. So we've got to the end of the kind of show, show and tell bit. Um, now it's very much open discussion. Uh, these are points we could potentially talk about. Things like what is missing from our approach? What would you do differently? What would you need to make this more widely usable? Who wants to get involved? Um, but it really is open. So I'll pass back to Ag to the chair. Thank you, Richard. Okay, yeah, so we, we've we got um, just, just under an hour left and we are very happy to use all that time to do as much answering detailed questions um, and or to explore ways that we might move forward together and, and collaborate on this stuff. Um, so in the, in the Google Doc, at, at the, um, on page David three of the Google has a question Doc. about the control vocabularies. Maybe we should answer that before we. Oh yeah. Um, so I've, I've, I've actually, I've included that okay. in, in a Q and A session. So I've captured a few of the questions that have come up that I think we should answer during this period. Um, but yeah, page three of the Google docs, questions and discussions. So I suppose just, just to say again, we're interested in in questions like, you know, what are the things that are missing in our approach? What you do differently? Um, what is needed in order to make the code more widely usable? Um, and then obviously, who would like to get more involved? Um, so, so the last one, maybe we leave until a bit later. Um, but do we do we have any? Um, any other questions that people just want to speak now, um, now that we have time to listen to your voices? And perhaps we've exhausted you with our um, with, with the amount of detail, which is fine because we did say it would be a technical meeting. Um, yeah. Alessandro, did you have? Did yeah, you have so I have, a, I, I have a question, uh, not being uh, an expert of the, of the format, uh, but just knowing uh, What's going on, for instance, in my institute? Like uh, we are currently building our uh, internal catalog with uh, with CCAN, and I see that there are efforts going on in the mapping uh, uh, stack uh, specification within the CCAN catalog. So, do you have an indication about uh, if this uh, is it, if it's it's worth and uh, what are the major advantages of uh, 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 putting efforts in? Uh, in stack and uh, in this sort of integration uh, uh, compared to uh, yeah, maintaining a, a, a CCAN instance. In case you have experience with the other catalog, of course, I mean, this is a- I, I've never heard of the other one. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's- uh... Yes, yeah, so, so I, I suppose, um, Alessandro, that, that one of our strong drivers here is, is this idea of making something very generic. And, and so um, one of the other questions that came up was, you know, how are we, how are we supporting ESM data, Earth system model data, as opposed to Earth observation data in stack? And in one way, I'd say we are not supporting it at all. So we are not, we are purposefully not creating specific extensions to stack for a given subdomain because our idea is that that we want we, we want the whole interface to say you can index whatever you like and as long as you provide the support for the api endpoint to say here are all the queryables that you can search on then then it doesn't matter what it is so so in a in one way we have we didn't think stack looks like the solution to all our problems. It, it, it looked like stack had, ta had taken over from open search in the EO world 
as being a strong contender. And given that so many organisations were pulling together behind Stack, it seemed to make sense that we would try and just go through the same interface and, and where we can use the same tools. Yeah, and of course, you are starting from scratch again and implementing this. So basically, you have the opportunity to take the best out of it. While uh, institutions that already have put some effort and investment in, in other catalogs, uh, they might still have the possibility of integrating this uh, uh, specification within their systems. So that's why probably I see that there are discussions going on on how to extend other catalogs with this. Yes, so, so I think um, in terms of if if you already have a, a system where you've where you've essentially recorded all the metadata and information in another catalog, then I think there there is you could you could potentially just use Stack as another um, endpoint that you exposed all that content from. In one way. So we, we started looking at Elasticsearch about seven or eight years ago, I think. Um, and it was the first time that we were trying to get a picture of all the files on our system and just trying to capture some basic metadata about them. Um, for us, Elasticsearch has proved, so we run our own cluster and that has proved a, a really useful way of capturing information and, and, and providing a scalable system. And, and so actually for us, we would say we already had this elastic search approach and we thought that that was useful and mature enough to then bolt the stack stuff on, onto. Um, so, so in a way that, that was our equivalent to CCAM maybe in this respect. I'm just looking as well. So um, one of the stack catalogs from Fedio Clearinghouse is, uh, I think it uses an open search, it ingests open search to generate the stack. So, um, and they use static catalogs, I think. So they're, they're kind of converting from one format to another and presenting it slightly differently. So uh, there, there is scope to do that, but like I say, it takes effort. And, and you might also, depending on what you have available, you, you could choose to use our system and, and build a plugin from your existing catalog into our system. Or depending on what you already have, it might be easier to, to just build a facade yourselves to expose stack records. Because we've we have, got a few years of open search experience with CCI. Um, and there are things that are good about open search, like the description document and kind of the, that reduction of uh, the description, you can uh, reduce it and give relevant stuff back. And um, what we didn't like was the hierarchy that you can't really escape from. And stack is really good for that. But, you know, yeah. both, they all have, everything has its flaws, right? Not everything, everything's of not course, perfect. Yeah. yeah. So just may, maybe just to go through some of these questions that, that came up along the way. Um, yeah, so so um, David, who who had to go, his his question about mapping between climate data hierarchies, experiment model realization, etc. Um, there are lots of ways you could do stack. So you you could if we if we chose to, well, one approach we could use is that we have static catalogs all the way down. So we have a static catalog that that is right at the level of a a big activity like CMIP6, and then it goes down through um, well, to institution and experiments and all those things. And that would be a perfectly viable, I believe, wouldn't it, Richard? As a Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm gonna bring up Pedio now because that's kind of what we're talking about. So um, if I quickly share, so this is this is what Pedio have done. Um, they've kind of just used collections and static catalogs to build a fasted search and um i was trying to find what i wanted and it was very difficult which kind of tells me that apis are much better <laughs> um you can kind of click down these things and it gives you a whole load of other other 
routes that you can take and you keep following it down, you end up somewhere else. Um, so they've kind of tried to use this, uh, here we go, here's our facet. So platform facet, we can click on this one and then we've got another catalog here. Um, and here we've got more catalogs, which is the year. So we've got year, month, day catalogs. So yeah, you could do catalogs all the way down if you wanted um, and, and kind of structure it. But it just depends how, what works best for your use case, I think is the answer. But this is a really useful thing to remember. So I'll, I'll make sure that these things are in the slides, but this is stackindex.org. If I go back to home, and this is where you find that page I showed with the ecosystem. So all the different clients and stuff. Uh, there's also a page of catalogs. And this is a list of public APIs and static catalogs that you can go and have a look at. So different people's implementations. And that might help uh, answer some questions as well. And so a, um, another question that came in was um, regarding our back end architecture for indexing. Um, about whether it makes sense to reuse um, the core um, and then develop data center specific plugins. Um, what are your thoughts on that, Richard? So my answer to that is um, yes, assuming you can't already do it. So uh, I would probably, I mean, the whole idea is that we create something that you can take and extend. Um, probably what you don't want to do or what we what we're hoping that people don't do is just fork what we've got and do their own thing because then we've kind of lost the the community and the collaboration pushing stuff back so if you find that there isn't a plugin to fit your use case then probably making that plugin and pushing it back um, and then hopefully that will solve someone else's use case and then we build an ecosystem of tools that work together um, I have used entry points to kind of define where how these things are picked up. It's probably likely that once we get, if we if we end up with lots of plugins, that that doesn't scale very well. Um, so maybe a different architecture around some kind of internal registry is better. But um, yeah, that that's that can be changed. But yeah, I I probably try and encourage you. To take a look at what's there, see if it can do what you want already. If it can't, make a plugin that does do what you want and push it back. And then through that, we can make it more generic and uh, hopefully other people can use it too. Excellent. And and I think um, David asked just before he left, um, so how are the control vocabularies used and why are they not used during asset generation? Just because we haven't done it yet. <laughs> so. Um, so I suppose we, we had quite a lot of discussion about control vocabularies and where they fitted into this. And we also have experience in the past of knowing how much time can be consumed by getting into details about, you know, actually defining vocabularies and um, all, all those kind of mappings and all, all that fun stuff. Um, we, we, we decided we want to constrain the problem and so the, the key use of control vocabularies is in our approach is just to add, well, it's, it's two things. It's, it's to allow people to search for, for example, if you're searching CMIP6, you can say source ID equals the name of my model when you're searching, but that you could also search model equals the name of the model because the idea of a model is a, a common um, concept within our system that we can have our own um, canonical or internal vocabulary term. So you could search model across lots of different data sets and it would map to whatever in that given collection they call a model, which as we know is different for CMIP5, CMIP6, et cetera. So, so what we're looking to do is have in our common terms, you know, things that we could all agree we could that, that had some meaning like experiment, like model, like instrument, but we're going to limit those to a relatively small number of, of kind of common facets. Um, 
the other aspects of using vocabularies is is a, as richard demonstrated is about providing more useful contextual information so it's the idea of being able to extend the existing information to provide a, a, a longer description of a term for example um or and or link out to um extra metadata or or external resources um so we hope to be able to provide a more rich uh, a richer search experience by being able to tap into those vocabularies and build these adapters that then expand as required we probably won't end up with strict checking that a term we found in a file is in a vocabulary because that would just lead us to have to have include everything and that would be very time consuming yeah we're, we're aware that at any point in time we may have versions of vocabularies that are slightly out of date um so yeah the the system needs to be quite forgiving in that respect so we have a, another question here. Have you experimented with virtual asset extension, virtual assets extension, e.g. composite extension in your ingestion pipeline to deal with aggregations such as NCML? Simple. I'm thinking we probably haven't, Richard, but we've talked no. about it. Yeah. And anything more to say on that? No. <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah it's not something that we've really um i guess in terms of our use case it's not something that comes up too often so it's less at the forefront of our minds um yeah so so one of the i think one of the discussions that you and i have had on this was about this idea of um x-ray data sets and pickled X-ray data sets. Um, so you could think that, that some items in the context of, of, of model data, large model data, some items will be the aggregation of a time series of 10 or 100 or 1,000 NetCDF files. Now, one, one way we could think about this as an aggregation like NCML is that as well as providing access to each of the assets, um, as a downloadable NetCDF entity. Um, we could all also potentially provide access to an NCML description or, or some other pre-aggregated object, which could be accessed via a URL or, you know, you could have a, a, yeah. an open DAP endpoint or something like that. Now, items also, there's the asset list, but there's also um, a links attribute to an item. And probably you put something like that in there. So if you've got a yeah, an aggregated object that encompasses all of your assets, you could link off to it. Um, we haven't yet tried uh, modifying the links and kind of generating those with our pipeline. So that's one that's one on the to do list. Is how do we? Because things like like you might find, um, for example, items might have metadata files that you want, or like a readme file that you want people to have easy access to and not have them buried in an asset list. So, um, I mean, there are different categories, so you can categorize your assets as data or metadata, but um, uh, things like quick looks as well, you can categorize that. But yeah, it might be that we have either a category or a, a link out to additional aggregations or something. There might be one to try and add as part of extend stacks in some way to give an additional category an asset that is an aggregation be one to toy with yeah yeah do we have any more questions or comments and again we 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 are very happy for very honest feedback. And so if, if you have any um, slightly destructive comments, they'll, they'll be useful to hear as well. And they may provoke really useful conversation. I guess, uh, I'll, I'll the, yeah, just a short one. Uh, I, mean, I think that for us, the, the most destructive thing 
of uh, of this effort will be that uh, within uh, within a project that we run, we will have to change the the user interface of the of the SESH website to comply uh, with Stack. So that's uh, so I think it's it's a very interesting uh, well it's it, it is a, a valuable effort that uh, that uh, you are doing. But I guess that in the next session uh, coming Friday we will understand more on the impact that uh, different uh, existing front end might uh, face in order to support this once this might scale to the old uh, ESGF, for instance. Do you have any expectations on, uh, on or anticipation on that? Um, so, so I think the, the our, our aim is to try and um, ease the process as much as possible for people that are using the existing ESGF search. So if if it's agreed that this is the next the, the next development for ESGF search, we are we want to make sure that both the, the web API and any kind of um, client tooling is is simple enough to to move over from one to the other because yeah i appreciate that we don't want to make a big headache for the community yeah that would help <laughs> especially because of project uh, running uh, uh, close to the end uh, and uh, you know like services have been uh, developed uh, yeah that, that would help to have uh, a smooth transition to be honest yeah yeah and I think most of that discussion we'll have in the uh, that other meeting because one one of the conversations within that is also um, how how you transition the the data holding sorry the the, the catalogs from the the current federated solar view of things to an elastic search view of things and I don't think we have a final position on that but my my expectation is that we could have a single elastic search instance running in the cloud that it, that was supported appropriately that in a way that we knew it was robust reliable that had very high uptime um, and then we would all need some way to be able to publish to that and some kind of gatekeeper around that but, but that would be quite quite a radical change from many of us running our own solar um, system and 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 having to learn about and interact with that. And again, we you know we we know that at this point in time that this is definitely not a a finished piece of work. The the engagement with the community now is about making sure that we we keep heading in the right direction, and hopefully that. Uh, we 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 get some interest from other people that might want to um, get more involved. Okay, well, I'm I'm not going to aim to keep everyone on the line for another half hour if if we've exhausted the conversation for now. But just just want to want to open up. Is there is there anything else that anyone would like to contribute? Either questions or answers or comments. Please feel free to speak. So far, no one's picked it apart. I feel like that's either a lie or <laughs> someone must have something to say. This is that doesn't work. It's all right, Richard. I've I've um, noted a number of things that I've thought. Oh, have we not thought about this? Have we not thought about that. So I'll I'll at least feed those back later on. Yeah, no, there's, there's definitely things that there are holes still. There are definitely holes. Okay, well, it, it feels like we've we've come to a. a a natural pause. Um, the what what I'll do is I'll I'll um, finish off the the notes um, from the discussion and send them out to everyone. And you know we, when you've when you've gone away and had a think about it, please do come back with any feedback. And and if you think if you think that you would like to install this system and have a play with it, obviously you can go down the binder route and all of that. But you know, if if there's a possibility that you'll be wanting to work with this and work with us on this, then we're more than happy to meet with you individually or in groups to get you started. 
and to to you know have have those complicated conversations to to get you up to a level where you can contribute and and we can collaborate i'm sure we can also send out the slides i'm going to have a look through and make sure that all the links are in there and uh, after talking through of it i might shuffle some of them around so it makes more logical sense but uh that all the content will still be there excellent so well richard a big thanks to you for um putting all that together at short notice and um and sharing all of that with everyone and all your hard work and all of this and and your team really appreciate that and um yeah we'll we'll be in touch with everyone thanks for joining us and we'll see some of you next friday <laughs>